Bear with us. Our chat will begin shortly in about eight minutes.
Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. We're glad you could, you could be here. Um, this is a Chile chat, and in these chats, we talk to specialists in specific fields about their experiences. And today, we'll be talking about personalization and customization in the nonprofit sector. For this talk, we'll be using Slido to gather some input from you. So you can participate by using the link below on your screen, which is chile-publish.com slash chilechat20 to join us over Slido, and you can give us your opinions on certain things. We'll use that information afterwards in the discussion that we do after. Um, I'd like to start with a test question just to make sure that everybody has access to it. You can open this in an extra browser window, or you can open it on your phone if you're more comfortable working on two different devices. So the first question is, has your company created personalized and customized marketing materials before? Three possibilities, yes, using a dedicated platform, yes, but we still need designers to create the variations, and no, not yet. Great, that was a good first question. We'll use that as a starting point for our discussion afterwards. Joining us today is Nico Potvin. So Nico Potvin is at Calm Design. He's a partner there, and Calm Design is a long-term customer of Chile Publish. Nico, thanks for being here today. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, well, Tell looking us a little forward bit about to yourself. On, uh, well, um, my name is Nico. I'm Nico Potvin. I'm partner here at Can at Can Design, and I'm also co-founder of uh, Cadenza. And we focus on design automation and brand tech. That's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Excellent. And you're based in Antwerp, but you're active all over the world, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are based here in Antwerp, and uh, we also have an office in the US uh, for server, serving uh, global co uh, customers around the globe. Excellent. So part of this Chile chat was pre-recorded. We had a good conversation a while back in the offices at Condesign. Um, and um, here's what happened during that recording. So many of your customers are nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. What makes a nonprofit organization different to a traditional company? Um, there are a couple of differences. Um, the main one is um, that you're working with volunteers. That's the first one. So that, that means that the people who need to use the tools, they want to use the tools to tell a story and tell the same story, but a bit more applicable to their situation. So um, what that means is that you, you need to have a way, a method to make it super easy, make it very accessible, and making sure that everybody has all the tools and all the reach that they need to tell the story and be involved in, in the same uh, goal, actually. So would it be fair to say that a nonprofit organization is more diffuse and more remote and less centrally controlled than a traditional company? Um, in a way, yes. The main difference with, with in, in, in industry or in, in major enterprise is that, that it's focused around a headquarters or a local affiliation somewhere in, a, in, in, in the company or in a country. Um, the difference with, with non-profit is that it's not that connected. Not everybody has access to yeah, the headquarters of that company. They just feel um, affiliated with, with the story and they want to well, be part of it. So it's on a volunteer base. So it, it is a lot more diffuse. It's a lot more locally controlled uh, with people who just do this f because they believe in. So that, that, that's a little bit of, the, of, of a difference. They they're probably not getting paid to, to tell that story, but they just want to be involved. And the, so the volunteer may or may not be a graphics professional who is capable of creating collateral, mm -hmm. specific collateral for an event or uh, a specific theme. Um, but they might also be people with no understanding of what's what's involved with that. Yeah, that that's even usually the case. Um, they are people who want to provide content. They want to tell something. They want to um, bring a certain message to their context, to their area. So they are absolutely no graphical experts. Of course, you need to make it as easy as you can. 
for, for them to do uh, something and to, to tell and, and to put in the content. Sometimes they need uh, approval, sometimes they need centrally stored content that, that, that gets uh, integrated from another source somewhere. Sometimes they have a lot of content already laying around that they just want to um, create over and over again, but with different entry points. So focus on the content and making sure that they can tell the story, that they can get their content in that design through that smart template and that they can start rolling. Okay, so how do you enable people that are remote and that are not specialized in the field to personalize and to customize collateral while keeping it on brand? Especially in, in, in times like these where, where remote working together is, is starting to become mainstream is um, online trainings, online training videos, um, also trying to find and create ambassadors, brand ambassadors, so that, that they can always contact somebody when um, they want to make sure that they're telling the story correctly that they're doing it right. Uh, because they're working with a lot of volunteers, uh, you have to make sure that everybody gets motivated enough and, and they don't wander off because of complexity. So it's, it's very um, important that you have things like um, built-in chat, uh, built-in support, um, good SLAs um, so that you can help everybody if a problem arises or they need a little bit more explanation on how it works. And that's where um, our team also helps together with um, our customers and that organization to make sure that that is organized in that way. Right. And um, most of the times it's a shared responsibility between the organization itself and our team that follows up with um, the end user. Right, so you guys basically build the tools that allow volunteers for nonprofit organizations or collaborators for, for nonprofit organizations to, to make these customized and personalized uh, collateral pieces. What is the difference between customization and personalization? So uh, there is a big difference. Uh, customization means uh, customizing the design. Of course, within the branded environment and the, uh, the branded guidelines, um, and it can be anything. Uh, it, it can be creating a leaflet, creating a folder, but also transforming that to um, different variants or different sizes, for example. If you want to create something for an advert, for every uh, um, media, it will be a different size, even for social media. Um, personalization is taking um, a design that exists and making it personal. Um, changing the story, changing and just adding content that can be centrally stored or manually uh, inputted uh, or uploaded via Excel files, for example. So customization is changing the design within the boundaries and within the logic and the output formats. Personalization is taking that design and making it your own and making sure that you can create one version or a thousand version with a couple of clicks. Uh, you, you briefly mentioned data uh, in, in like an Excel sheet. Mm -hmm. um, more and more of marketing and marketing communications becomes data driven today. Yeah. How does data plug into that initiative? Um, well, we are always um, looking at, uh, at making our tools better, especially on data management, because data becomes a lot more important, as you mentioned as well, uh, but also structured data. So there are two types of data, uh, data which needs to be validated and created by the organization. So for example, contact data, uh, business hours, um, things like uh, contact information, things that can be shared and cannot be shared, especially in those uh, GDPR times. So that data can be stored centrally and with a couple of clicks, you can just select, well, I need that data set for location with the correct addresses, etc. If something changes, that will be pushed to every output already. Local data is data that people enter because of their context. They have data uh, which can be a piece of text or a local image or something else. So everything that has to do centralized coming from um, central data system, PIM systems, DAM systems, or you can use your own local data. Local data and nonprofits uh, is um, a tricky field because um, 
end users do not know what kind of data or what format of that data needs to be used. Text is easy, it's just typing something in and that works. But an image is something else. Um, of course, technically, anything you put into a document can be printed or can be put online as long as you use it small enough, for example. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we try to um, not, um, well, take that away from the end user, making sure that it, that's not their problem. So we always suggest take any image, take that image, uh, place it somewhere, for example. And uh, when they put that in a document, we calculate how big that can be used. And for example, it cannot be used for a full page or it cannot be used uh, for print, but it can be used online, for example. That's something that we then um, make sure that the platform already automatically places that in the correct format. And when we output it, it gets um, converted into the correct output format without any troubles. So if I understand correctly, you're taking some of the expertise and some of the checks and balances linked to creating graphics, you're embedding mm -hmm. them in the tool yeah. so that the end user doesn't have to worry about that kind of correct. stuff. It needs to be worry-free. They just need to, is this the correct image for the story I'm trying to tell? That's the only thing that they need to be worried about. The technical aspect is something we will handle. Okay. It makes it a lot more easier for them and the, the output can be can be used in multiple ways as we as we were talking about omnichannel for example not only print uh, but also online they want to take that exact same piece of content with the correct data and push it to different output formats and that needs to be um, there's a huge technical thing that needs to be managed but it's something that we do right right so you have a, a nonprofit organization that is driven by volunteers. Volunteers can be anywhere in the world. And what you guys are doing is creating the tools that allow them to build their collateral safely, technically sound, etc. cetera. Um, what kind of an impact does that have on an organization? What's the before and after, typically? Um, well, there are a couple of things. Um, of course, um, time. Saving time is a lot. It's, it's a big impact. Um, we usually see situations where a nonprofit does not have an entire graphical team to manage everything. Because as we're living in, 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 in a world where visual communication is key, all that data or all that, that, that collateral needs to be created and they need big teams to manage it. Mm -hmm. um, by making sure that that is something that that volunteer or, or their, um, um, their team can do themselves um, makes it first of all a lot more content that can be created, a lot more faster. Uh, so that means that you don't need to involve a graphic team because that is managed by the templates. Um, you take away a lot of overhead and a lot of stress mm -hmm. um, because um, usually smaller teams, they get all kinds of requests you get a lot of small requests and that, that's a huge um, impact on the designer or the small design team that they have. So cumbersome tasks like um, creating a an, an, an highly uh, localized version of the key message can be created by a volunteer themselves so that the, 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 um, uh, the designer that they have in their team does not need to do that themselves. They can think about the strategy. They can think of how we're going to communicate and how it needs to look. But all the, the, the collateral itself can be created by those teams themselves. So it creates a lot of extra time. It creates a lot of extra worry-free um, management of the entire communication process. And at the end, it usually saves them, well, also a little bit of, 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 of money. Uh, right. because they can output a lot more that they can do before. So they have a lot more output and a lot more reach uh, that they can create. Oh, cool. So if I understand correctly, you're, you're basically enabling self-service. Yeah. The volunteers can do the work themselves safely. Yes. Yeah. You're freeing up the designer to focus on more strategic tasks on Indeed. the why of communication and yeah. not the repetitive stuff yeah. that, they, that they constantly do. And you're, you're saving a lot of resources that can ben, then be used for the important things that these uh, nonprofits are, are typically involved in. Yeah, yeah. In projects like these, 
What is a typical first deliverable? We talked about low hang, low hanging mm -hmm. fruits and quick wins. What's like the first type of asset you, you typically see? Is it a printed flyer? Is it an online resource? Is it a, a Facebook wallpaper? Um, it, it really depends. It's, um, it's different for every uh, organization, um, but mostly comes down what causes the most pain. So it, it, if I look at everything, um, sometimes it has to do with, with signage. Um, they want to, they want to f for example, we have, we have an, um, a small sports center mm -hmm. and um, they play in a very high competition. And what they wanted to do is they want to uh, make sure that the, the competing team, when they play at their uh, facilities, are feeling welcome. So what they've done is they've used our solution just to create small signs that say, hey, welcome team, please go back to this is the, the way that you need to walk and here is your locker and, and we'll see you on the field and this is the referee and so All on. of that gets personalized? Yeah. Wow. Every week. Wow. And that's an easy thing for just creating small signs, signs that you can s slide in, in, in the, the system that they have uh, in, in that facility. Others um, help their local teams um, communicate and explain what the um, local concerns are, for example. If you look at political parties, they have always have a local division and they want to make sure that the common way of communicating is transferred to that local um, affiliation, but mm -hmm. they want to make sure that the content and the context is relevant for that local instance. So that has to do with local communication like small newspapers or flyers or folders, that kind of stuff. Um, and that usually um, helps with everybody because there's always a need and transferring that need to a very first specific set is, is not always common, mm -hmm. but it is always a small step that you can take. And, and I would always suggest to, or advise to look for the thing that causes the most pain and solve that one. When running a project like this, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of stakeholders. There's some, some change management mm -hmm. involved. How long do you typically see a project like that go from start, from, from inception, to first initial results? It depends a little bit on the size of the organization, uh, but we always talk about weeks. Okay. Um, why? Uh, it has to do with, with getting some basic things organized, but also get everybody involved, schedules aligned. We usually deliver projects like these uh, around six to eight weeks. That's wow. usually the, the, the time that it takes. And it can be done uh, sooner as well, uh, but then it depends on scope and getting people involved, but it can also take a little bit longer uh, if you need to involve more people or extra external companies that needs to be uh, added, those kind of things. So it, it, it really depends on, but on average, six to eight weeks. So Nico, to wrap it up, when does it make sense for a nonprofit organization to look at a project for personalization and customization? Um, I think it, it helps the most with an organization to make sure that, that their brand is being used across the organization by everybody, even people that do not know how to use a brand. It, it, it helps, especially when making sure that they can work with it, that they, a little bit more self-enablement of working with the brand, um, taking away the, the, the burden, the hassle, or, or even the, the logistics of doing that many output creations and, and uh, making sure that their local teams can do this, this themselves. This at the end makes sure that the organization can have more resources available to focus on why they started this, being able to achieve their goals and, um, and working on the strategy to make sure that they can reach right, that. So they don't have to focus on the logistics yeah. of getting their brand out to scale. Yeah. They can focus on their reason of existence and in the process, they can empower and enable all of their volunteers, uh, knowing that the brand will be respected and knowing that the data will be yeah, correct. Exactly. Absolutely. Cool. That was a fun discussion. Um, hang on, bear with me.
Um, so thanks a lot for your input. Uh, we've had some really good feedback from the audience. Uh, Nico, uh, I can't help but noticing you were wearing the same shirt today live as you were during the recording. Thanks for that and good for continuity. <laughs> Um, yes, I have it here. The first question we, <laughs> the first question we, we talked <laughs> about was, has your company created personalized and customized marketing materials before? Um, about half of them have done using a dedicated platform. But before we dive in too deep, I would like to ask, how would you define customization of marketing materials? Um, well, as we talked um, during um, the video, and, I, and, and as I mentioned, there are two differences. There's customization and there's personalization. Customization has to do with allowing a smart template and an end user to combine brand guide guideline rules and design rules together so that they can create something that maybe changes depending on certain variables within the document being its size, being being it um, message, uh, being it content types and so on. Personalization um, is a little bit different. Personalization has to do with your own content and not only the personalization about name and, and addressing somebody and saying, hi, Nico, for example, but also personalizing the content based on the context where it is in written. So, um, if you're talking about uh, personalization within the nonprofit sector, um, it is very handy to allow an end user to take the common message and make sure that it's relevant uh, within their field, within their groups, within their organizations locally, uh, in, in their organization. So that's a little bit of uh, the difference between both. Okay, excellent. Um... In, if we move on to, to the next question, um, a lot of people that are joining us today are founders. Um, second largest categories are marketing and, and sales and business development. In your experience, what are the typical profiles that get involved in a personalization and, and a customization project for nonprofit? Um, I think it's a combination of different profiles. Um, why? Because we want to make sure that not only um, marketing um, is involved, but also others. Um, it can be strategic partners like, like founders uh, in this case, or it could be um, IT teams as well, because there's always some technicality that's going on and designers also. So the, the, the best approach is involving both the business team, being marketing, being sales, being higher up, um, but also designers so that they know on how to design for personalization, for customization, uh, to make sure that the designs can accommodate it. And then also technical profiles so that they can help with um, some technicalities or making sure that everybody has the right tools, uh, being a good internet connection or a correct browser, and that they at least know that this system is available within the organization. Uh, that helps with uh, the adoption rate. All right, cool. So the dream team essentially is made up of designers, marketers, and, and tech, tech people or IT people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. So the next question is, what is the biggest impact of personalized marketing? Um, the largest part of our audience thinks that building a better customer experience is the main goal or the main impact of personalized marketing. What's your experience with that? Um, if I look at, at the, the goals that we've set with uh, different projects, uh, what we see is that, of course, the, 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 the customer experience, being the end user, being the, the, your customer or your persona or um, any, anyone that you're focusing your message on, um, gets reached more efficiently and with the correct context. So there's a huge benefit on, on um, telling the story which is fitting within um, your demographic, within the groups that you are focusing on. Um, so that makes it a lot easier and a lot more efficient to get that. The second one, talking about efficiency, is also getting the process in, um, done quicker than before. If you look at a, at a classical process, it is requesting 
setting up a briefing, briefing a designer, designer designs something that gets sent back, that goes to a copywriter maybe, that then needs to be approved and sent on. And, and what you can do now is you can take everything in your own hands. You can go to the system, click on creating a new document based on our templates, enter your content, click save and download your collateral visit because all the other things like guidelines, messaging and others are all managed automatically within the system. So you don't need to worry about the technical stuff about um, how something has been set up and just put the message out there, click on uh, save and you're ready to go. Oh, cool. So the, it's not just about a better customer experience for all the users. It's also about creating efficiencies and, and getting marketing out at scale as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Then the next thing we asked was, is your organization ready for personalization and uh, customization? What would you consider, when would you consider an organization to be ripe for this kind of activity? Um, First of all, um, some of the things that, that need to be done is um, if you're allowing a lot of people to um, start working with your brand, you have to make sure that your brand is ready for it and also that the designs are ready for it. So um, that has to do with the designs itself. If you're starting to automate or personalize, then you also need to make sure that the designs are ready to accommodate it so that you also uh, need to rationalize everything that you might have. How can you consolidate different designs, different variations for customizations um, onto a, a specific template so that they can be um, built up more easily and also be used more effectively? That's that's one thing. Um, the second thing is also um, when you are ready to um, to let go of, of um, well, a little bit of the mass logistics that go behind mass personalization. So um, you don't need to worry about getting all those designs ready and, and working on every variation and sending it back. No, that's something that the end user can do themselves. So you can have, well, you can have more time and make more time available to uh, worry about strategy, worry about uh, other things besides creating X version of the same design. Okay, so it's not just about um, about uh, enabling so, um, self-service. It's also about first making sure that the brand is ready and defined in a way that it allows for customization. That, that it's it's defined like what's what can be changed and yeah. what can't. And then next, you have to be the will. You have to have the will to dedicate some more time to strategic things and less to the, like the manual repetitive parts of the job of creating all these personalized iterations. Yeah, yeah, cool. absolutely. So the next question we asked are, what are the biggest struggles of companies with personalized marketing? And this is what uh, the audience thinks about that. Now, it, as a former salesperson, to me, these are objections, right? Um, do you see any showstoppers here? No, no. Um, there are a lot of things that, that um, objections that, that might lie here, like data sources are scattered. Um, it doesn't need to be uh, an issue because these days, you can easily combine things. You can combine PIM data, you can combine uh, ERP data, CRM data together with designs um, to have a lot of that process automated. So if data is scattered, you can combine them. You can combine um, assets uh, in a DAM solution with metadata from a PIM solution. And if you would drop that asset to a certain template, it will be automatically populated. Things like that are easily set up and, and do not need to be an issue. Other things like incorrect customer data um, or, or audio segmentations are too broad. No, you can personalize. So you can make sure that you can target the correct audience, that you um, can have the correct data. If the data is changed somewhere, it will be automatically populated to uh, the end result. So I don't think that there are a lot of um, struggles that are listed that are that are um, not easy easy to solve um, so i don't think it's 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 that big of an issue actually you can you can even start right now actually i remember a conversation we had recently where you looked at a number of things that came up in in discussions and you call them myths 
right? And the part of the part of the work that, <laughs> yeah. that you had to do was basically confront those myths and and test them to reality. Yeah. Yeah. The next question we asked is what type of assets would you most likely want to customize or personalize? So would it be more for online use? Would it be print production? Would it be flyers? And we're getting a, a bunch of answers here. So a lot of uh, printed collateral, retail signage, so large format, sell sheets, brochures, uh, online things. When, when you roll out a project like this, what's the first thing that gets personalized? What's the thing where people, oh, we were waiting for that? Um, well, it, it depends on the organization, uh, but my answer is always the ones that make the most sense and really are the low hanging fruit. What is the biggest struggle you have today? Everything that is listed here is something that you can automate. Um, you can create flyers for prints. You can create the same flyers for low res and pu publish them on, on issue, or you can create anything that needs to be printed on something. Um, if it's free data, so data that you can type in automatically, drop in, in an image, or that you can create thousands of them via uh, variable data processing, via Excel sheet, via database model. Everything is more or less automatable as long as the design is ready for it. And if data is needed, the data is structured. Then you can create, I think, any kind of output, uh, being it a simple flyer to a very complex packaging solution, um, it's all possible. Okay, so we also have a, a live question here. Uh, if data is scattered, you'll still need someone to handle the data hygiene, or will automation make that struggle easier? What's the impact of data, hy data hygiene on a project for you guys? Um, it depends on how dirty it is. Um, no, that that's maybe a strange answer, but um, data um, can have different roles within personalization or within customization or within automation. Data can trigger some things from settings point of view, for example, how big something needs to be, what the size is, what the output formats are. Um, so it can have an impact. Um, but the good thing is that you can, with a couple of flicks, you can recreate it with the correct data set. You don't need to redesign everything because a lot of design teams in well, in classical uh, workflows, you need to design something. And at the end, you notice that something is wrong, that you have to redo everything. No, you just republish the data, click on uh, re-render, and everything is updated. Oh, so any changes in, in data hygiene are replicated automatically throughout all the assets that you've already personalized then? It could be. It could be. It depends on, on how, it, how it's been set up. But you can you can manage that data and you can decide yourself what kind of extra uh, renders that need to be created or that they need to be recreated. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Then we asked, do you think your team would be able to create personalized assets in an online editing tool? And about two thirds of the people said yes. Our team can be self sufficient. Um, what is the learning curve for somebody with zero experience? Let's say you're a volunteer for a nonprofit organization somewhere far away from the HQ and you get a platform. How long does it take for these people to be able to customize a, an asset towards what they need? Um, not that long, actually. Um, we see uh, in, in a lot of our volunteer projects that um, the adoption rate is quite high. Um, things have to do, of course, with uh, with how eager they are to start using this system. That's the first thing. Second, um, user experience, of course, uh, making it as easy as possible, um, making sure that they don't need to worry about technical things. So as long as you are able to fill in a form, select a field, or, or um, filling in uh, a text, element, uh, you're good to go. So as long as you can type and you can click, you should be able to fill in any uh, output that you can imagine. Oh, fantastic. Well, I mean, that's one of the things we also discuss here internally a lot. And, and we always say personalizing or customizing any asset should not be any more difficult than the things that you already do every day. 
Like for example, if you if you take if you get grab money from an ATM, what you're doing is you're authenticating, you're putting in some data, and that's it. You're done. You're typing a couple things, you're selecting a couple of things, and you're done. It shouldn't be more difficult than that. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question is live, and um, the question here is: Do we still need designers? Are you wiping out the need for designers worldwide? No, <laughs> no. We always need designers, but we need to um, allow them to do different things. So, um, designers, in the case of automating, are doing repetitive tasks. They're just doing the same thing over and over and over again, and it just takes a lot of time. Um, I always take the example: if you ask a designer um, to take the same amount of time, and in the same amount of time they need to create a thousand business cards or come up with a new communication strategy, all of them will probably um, select the communication strategy. So the time, we still need designers, but the time that they are, are using now to create variants of the same design, take that time and allow them to think about strategic stuff. And it will make their lives a lot more, um, a lot more, uh, well, fun, actually. Okay. Cool. So the next question is, what do you think the organization's minimum annual budget needs to be for personalized marketing? And we thought, okay, is it in the tens of thousands? Is it in the hundreds of thousands? Or is it really cheap? Is it only thousands? In your experience, in what kind of ballpark are we looking? Um, I think most of the audiences have it correct. Uh, on average, um, of course, there are always exceptions, uh, tens of thousands. Sorry, and not on the other element of the scale. So at the beginning of the tens of thousands, you can do a lot of things. Um, you can have a platform, you can have templates, you can train a team um, and, and set up your first uh, personalization templates quite easily. Um, there are some comparisons that you could make. Uh, think of it as an average size car, for example. Um, it's more or less the price range you can think of on average to start doing things with um, customizable and personalizable templates. Oh, fantastic. So not like a Rolls Royce, but like something a family would, would typically use. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. 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 Um, the next question we have is how long on average does it take to be up and running? And that is from like you, you get the go ahead, yes, to having a, a fully rolled out working platform with people trained and ready to use it. Um, we usually, uh, talking weeks. So on average, uh, a project, uh, between four to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and that has to do with, with getting some processes aligned, getting schedules aligned, um, getting things configured and set up and trained, um, content added, uh, configured, tested, and then rolled out. So that's, that's mostly the time range that you need to think. Um, of course, it can be a lot more depending on the complexity, but for ballpark, four to eight weeks, and you're good to go. OK. Another live question we have is, uh, for a project to be successful, what has to be in place as far as technology, uh, but also like processes and, uh, and, and human resources? Um, first of all, there need to be um, designs, there need to be rationalized designs, there need to be um, willingness also. So that also means that there needs to be a little bit of a change management to um, allow your um, users to create things themselves. Um, you can look at specific data sets and others that might be uh, need to be linked and need to be connected. Um, but other than that, um, a little bit of time, um, a little bit of persuasion, and a little bit of, of yeah, willingness to use uh, and to, to um, enthusiast your end users uh, normally should be completely fine to get, to get started. All right, so that means a lot of organizations are pretty much ready for, for this. There's no big changes required to the organization before they can be successful no. with personalization and customization. Fantastic. 
Nico, yeah. thank you so much for being here with us. We really appre appreciate your insights. Uh, we're really happy that you were able to share them with us. Um, is there any, any last words you want to say to the audience? Uh, well, uh, thanks for listening to me. Uh, hopefully uh, it helped. Um, and always happy to connect later on and see uh, how we could help. Absolutely. If there's any questions or remarks you want to get in touch with us, feel free to reach out directly to us and we'll, uh, we'll get Nico involved and, uh, and have a discussion afterwards. So, everybody, thank you for joining. Um, it was a lot of fun to be here. Uh, I'm going to ask you to hang on for just a little moment. We have a few more questions for you that allow you to say what you thought of the event and how we can make it better next time. Um, uh, you can let us know what you think, and I would ask you to keep an eye out for the future Chili Chats. <laughs>